Hello, dear colleagues, once again. Uh, we have the very final preparations for the webinar that will take uh, place in a moment. Uh, if uh, still some of the presenters would like to test microphones, uh, we of course would be still happy to do so because it's very important to hear everyone. Uh, unfortunately, Participants of the webinar will not be uh, allowed the audio and or video, but they will be able to write in the chat. And we will also kindly ask all participants to use um, the pod dedicated for the open answers and open questions. So we will arrange that. But uh, the, the rest, the presenters, they would need to mute microphones when uh, one of us will be speaking uh, so that we don't have echoes in the room. So now I would like just to ask Sumati, maybe you would like to test your microphone once again? I still have no, no, this is Marcy. no voice from you. No, I cannot hear you. Testing one, two, three. Uh, yes, Marcy, I can hear you, but we are doing testing with Sumati from Brussels. Marcy, sorry. Uh, so it's okay. We still, we still don't, don't have any voice. But I know uh, that uh, actually Secretary people are at hand and maybe uh, when we start the session, maybe we can have testing in parallel, uh, some, some chats behind the screen. So actually it's uh, the right time to start now and I need to start uh, the first uh, very important event, the first webinar in uh, European Distance Learning Week. Uh, that has been arranged for the uh, for another year in collaboration with our colleagues from United States Distance Learning Association, as they have a longer tradition to have U.S. National Distance Learning Week for many years, and uh, since uh, 2016 we have reg regular agenda uh, every day also on European arena. So today uh, we have the first event. Uh, I, I hear echo and this makes me uh, feel the hope that maybe Sumati is already Can there. you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. Thank you very much for joining in. And now I will ask you to mute your microphone so that we don't have echoes any longer. Yeah, that's going to be tough. Uh, is that better? <laughs> I, will, I will arrange that. Thank you. So uh, this webinar is the first one, as I mentioned to you, and uh, it is dedicated to open the week and to discuss uh, why it is important to have this event. So uh, actually, uh, every day webinars, panel sessions of experts, scholars, practitioners will be offered to Eden and the European community, as well as USDLA community. Uh, so that we can together discuss a variety of cutting-edge, open and online learning topics from innovations in design and open education research. And we all agree that we need these events already last year in order that we can exchange, share and know what we are thinking about to fine-tune our understandings and concepts. So uh, before I introduce uh, the participants of this first uh, important panel, I would like to share with you the agenda that each of you may access also at Eden website. So today we will open the floor for challenges and opportunities of innovation, but every day at the same time we will have webinars dedicated on a definite topic. 
So tomorrow, on Tuesday, at the same time, we will have a webinar on perspectives on open education. It is a very important topic in Europe and we all understand that we see this topic from a variety of angles. So tomorrow we will have Fabio Nashimbeni, an EDIN executive committee member and other co colleagues uh, here to discuss open education issues. Wednesday is dedicated to discuss designing of learning spaces in open and distance learning. And here we will have presentation and discussion session as well. Uh, Lisa Maria Blaschke, uh, Eden Vice President, will be moderating that session. Also, the same hour and the same room. On Thursday, we will have a very uh, a, a, a interesting panel that will be directly broadcasted from CONUS, from Vitovas Magnus University in Lithuania, which will be dedicated to discuss reconsidering access, quality, and flexibility of education. A very helpful topic for policymakers, decision makers, and uh, it will be direct broadcast from a physical event in CONUS. Friday will be the same time we also scheduled international experiences with OERs. Here you will see not only European but also more global initiatives. And Antonella Poche, who is the chair of the steering committee of the Network of Academics and Professionals in Eden, will be chairing that. And there will be one more additional event, again broadcast from uh, Lithuania, from my university. Uh, on Friday, November 10th, uh, on a, a little bit earlier time schedule, which will be dedicated to four keynotes that will be also directed, directly broadcasted from Kona. So this is the agenda for those who joined in today and want to know what is planned for the whole week. So, uh, in the very beginning, I mentioned to you that uh, we have a panel today, and in the panel we have very honorable uh, members of the panel, very um, uh, experienced people, professionals, working in the area, and also uh, our close friends uh, from uh, sister associations from the USA, from Europe, uh, and also from the European Commission, and I would like to introduce them now to all of you. I will move to discussion window so that you can see them more clearly uh, face to face uh, online. So we have Sumadi Subramanian from European Commission, Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, Innovation and uh, Education Innovation IT Technology Department. We have Brikena Somaki, Director of Lifelong Learning Platform. And thank you, Brikena, for joining the second year also with us. It's also a part of your activity already also. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson, Senior Lecturer from Institute of Educational Technology from the Open University. Uh, Marcy Powell from European, United States Distance Learning Association. Sharon Goldstein from Berkeley College Online. And Timothy Reed, Associate Prof Professor, Vice Chancellor of Methodology and Technological Innovation, National Distance Education University in Spain. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for joining in. And in a moment, uh, I will give the floor to each of you. But uh, now, uh, I would like to ask uh, Marcy and Sharon to actually bring this link forward. And uh, I already told that the United States Distance Learning Association is holding its National Distance Learning Week. So please share with us what is on at uh, your National Distance Learning Week. Whomever of you, maybe Marcy, please. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for allowing us to join you today. We very much value our partnership with the We were very excited and decided to, to create the EPL project and the great collaboration. I'm going to ask Sharon to give you a little brief history of NCLW and what's on in the next week. Sharon? Great. Good morning. Thanks again, Marcy. Uh, always good to see you. Um, 
So uh, National Distance Learning Week began in 1997. So we are at our 20th year um, as of this moment. And it was a request actually from the then current president of the association, John Flores, who is now our chief executive officer. Uh, he made this request to Senator Edward Kennedy to recognize distance learning and to uh, recognize the USDLA and to actually name this week as National Distance Learning Week. Um, and so again, we're in our 20th year. We are nationally recognized. And we've now encouraged our state chapters as well. Uh, we've encouraged them to create special events in their respective states in concert with the events of the headquarters. Uh, and so I can say proudly that USDLA is offering a very robust schedule of webinars this week. Um, and I believe we have two, possibly three a day, and those can be found on the USDLA.org website. So I invite everybody to uh, take part in those. They will be recorded and able to be accessed as well if you're unable to see them live. In addition, um, our members, and we have constituents in the pre-K market, in higher ed, uh, in the corporate market, in government, military, as well as telehealth. And so each of those members in their respective schools and, and universities and corporations and so forth are also hosting events. Uh, I'm with Berkeley College, and we have a very exciting and robust week of events planned. Um, our um, events are linked also to the USDLA.org website. So once again, I invite everyone to take a look at that um, for an exciting week. And I thank you, um, Elena, and guests for Eden for um, being open to the collaboration between Eden and USDLA. And I know Marcy can speak a bit more about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, Marcy and Sharon. Uh, yes, we, we just uh, hear you a little bit low, but I, I hope the voices will increase uh, as, as you will be presenting. Uh, so now we open the, the first uh, webinar topic, which is the challenges and opportunities of innovation. It, it seems to be a rather broad topic, but we noticed in, in Eden, in, in European discussions, that actually this is not too broad for us as the overview is always very complex and we need to bring in different initiatives and try to start uh, discussing them, grouping them, categorizing them and trying to understand what they are and how uh, they can be useful for educational organizations and education providers. I just uh, take note that this webinar will be recorded and the record will be published added in website afterwards. So with the opening panel, um, we address uh, the speed developments of innovations on different levels, micro, meso, and macro level, and their complexity. At first glance, in Europe, we have preconditions, the majority of preconditions established. We have immense possibilities established for innovations and for implementing, embedding those innovations and practices. But they are very complex and concise solutions. Um, we have open education in a variety of forms. We uh, uh, are happy about open coordination groups. We discuss how to foster developments in member states. And uh, this is led by the European Commission. We have new instruments and tools uh, that have been established to agree upon digitally competent organizations, citizens, teachers, learners, and they come of great help as, as the new instrument, but how to put them in practice and how to do and how to proceed with them. We also think about new training schemes, certification possibilities, recognition of digital skilled employees and companies, but also recognition of open learning and open education. And we think that we are all here to address this very, very emerging and very pending issues together and not otherwise uh, rather than an open uh, discussion and open collaboration. So with this, I now will invite uh, each panel member to reflect upon uh, 
the innovations may be mentioned, maybe you have additional ones and other insights. And uh, I would like to start with Sumati. Uh, I just don't know if you are going to use any slides uh, or we shall proceed without them. So please let me know. And I invite you, Sumati Subramanian, European Commission, DG Education, Youth Support and Culture from Innovation and EIT Department. We know that the landscape is um, very complex. Uh, it's uh, quite developed in some member states, and it's uh, at the point uh, where lots of developments are being put in place in several others. And this brings its own challenges in terms of uh, access to, uh, to students, to teachers, and so on. But what I would like to um, address today, maybe, is um, what teachers need uh, in the form of training to be able to use all uh, uh, the, the panorama of um, instruments and methodologies and, and um, various other uh, um, programs that are available and how to make it interesting and what kinds of training need to be in place and what can the commission do uh, to support this. I think we, uh, in our document, which was um, published in May in 2000, 2017, which is the renewed EU agenda for higher education, we did uh, mention several points, uh, some of them being um, the need for more flexible and modular courses and for informal and formal training to be integrated and as uh, as the student body composition changes, we have to make all these available. And we are always constantly looking out for models that really work for best practice sharing. So we'd be more than happy to highlight these examples and also to uh, learn and support if more development needs uh, to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sumati. I think these are very uh, important and relevant, relevant questions uh, for our discussion that will take place also after this panel uh, introduction and reflection from each member. So I took also note of this. Also, I encourage anyone, anyone, either participants or speakers, if you want to post any a URL or important reference or post an important question, please do that in the chat as well when we are making reflections. So now we continue and I would like to invite the uh, Dikana uh, just a moment. <laughs> yes, we can hear you Dikana, please proceed. Hello, everyone. And do you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Perfect. Hello. Uh, um, I'm uh, in a Skype room, so oh, I apologize with the uh, if the sound sounds a bit weird, I it just uh, went out of a, a conference here in Brussels about crisis management. So, uh, uh, and, and I had to leave the lunch break, which was a Syrian in the cuisine in a lunch break. So just to say that I'm really glad to actually contribute to this discussion as I did also last year. 
Um, what I, I can bring from the perspective of a lifelong learning platform, which, which I represent, and, and for those that don't know the platform, we are an umbrella organization of uh, more, more than 40 European networks. Some of them are also worldwide, uh, uh, so they are not necessarily just limited to the European Union or the European uh, Geographical European. And the, our main mission is obviously to have this holistic approach to education and promote lifelong learning. Think. And uh, uh, I can move to the second slide. So, oops, it's going too fast. Here it is. So, innovation and lifelong learning. I think. I I wanted to basically say a few main points, which um, are very important and become more, more, much more important when we talk about innovation, learning, and innovation go hand in hand. If we want to innovate, we need to also uh, invest more in learning. And we, we have to also change the way we learn, learn at the uh, now What days in our education system? Therefore, we believe that um, the secret of innovation will actually lay in the lifelong learning, and uh, this was also some. Thing that we worked on during the year, and uh, also we know that we are promoting at European uh, uh, level uh, um, integral as much as possible, like the concept of. Of lifelong learning, which is yet relatively new, uh, um, although there are many communications from the Commission that, that uh, do pro promote lifelong learning, do uh, uh, encourage member states to have a lifelong learning strategies, and most of the member states do have that strategy in place, but that's uh, not enough because. It's Implementation is yet 
packing in most of the members states. So it's uh, yet a lot to do in uh, lifelong learning, and we believe that is of course an paradigm that is the most innovative concept in a way that is also because it's, it's calling for a true, true transformation of our education system. Uh, um, changing our uh, um, the courses, like you mentioned before, like some month here mentioned before, having um, more flexible uh, curricula, more flexible pathways uh, that are more adapted to a lifelong learning uh, concept uh, uh, is, of course, the transformation for our current education system that need to happen at some point but it's yet not happening and I put it the picture of my guide over here because uh, actually it's a Uh, it's an interesting uh, um, thing I found out when I was searching about innovation and lifelong learning. He was an innovator. He was innovating over time, but he was learning by himself. He was learning, reading, and he was alive. Thank you very much, Prikana. Uh, that was uh, really very interesting, and I see that uh, Swati uh, added to one point, like open source learning, which is an emerging education practice. Also, I think uh, you all can see the pod with the question, which recent innovation would you highlight? I mean, anyone from participants and speakers also please use this pod to submit the keyword that is important uh, to you. And then we, of course, will open the discussion. So now we continue and I invite Rebecca and we'll be opening the slides in a moment uh, to continue our reflection time. Please, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Irina, and um, hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Rebecca Ferguson. I'm based at the Open University in the UK, and I think the reason I've been invited here today is at the moment I'm the lead author on a series of reports we've been producing um, for the last six years about innovating pedagogy. Um, this is a series of reports um, focusing on teaching, learning, and assessment in the interactive world. And it's sort of designed to guide teachers primarily in um, how they can move forward in this area. So I think it's, it's very apposite that I'm following on from Brickana. Um, she's talking about um, the innovative practices in knowledge education. She's talking about lifelong learning, talking about linking formal and informal. These are all sorts of things that we've been covering in the reports. So what we found, going back to 2012, was that people who were talking about innovation in education all tended to be talking about technology. They'd say, you know, we've got tablet computers, we've got this piece of computing, we've got this piece of computing. But they weren't really talking about what we can do with it and what we can achieve with it. Um, so this series of reports 
it's produced by a large team of academics here at the Open University. We're in the um, Institute of Educational Technology. We also work with partners around the world. So we work with SRI International in the US. Um, we've worked with uh, people over in Singapore. And this year, we're working with the Lynx Lab in Israel. And every year, we, we pull together things which we think are of interest, pedagogies, uh, sort of practices and theories of education that are rising to the surface. Um, we list them. We usually come up with a list of about 30. Then we discuss them. We sort of rough out some ideas. And we narrow it down each year till, to 10. So, so far, we've, we've published um, 50, 10, 50 pedagogies. We've got another 10 coming up next month. So our belief is that if we don't have innovative pedagogy, if we don't have new practices in education, our technical innovations don't necessarily achieve anything. And I'm putting up the example here of the interactive whiteboard. Um, interactive whiteboards were very big 10 years ago uh, when my children had just started school. I remember their school getting them in. I remember everybody being very excited about interactive whiteboards. But actually, the teachers didn't have the time to sit down and think about new ways of teaching because they were busy teaching. And quite often, they ended up just having a very high tech um, blackboard, which didn't work as well as when they had chalk. So there was more work that needed to be done in the background, more work that needed to be done to support teachers. So thinking back about 10 years here, uh, Charles Crook and his colleagues looked at um, Web 2 um, being rolled out in UK schools. And I thought they came up with a series of very good points that innovative technologies can do several things. They can stimulate new ways of inquiry. They can provide opportunities for engaging in collaborative learning. Now, of course, we could engage in collaborative learning without any technology at all. We can just talk to the people next to us. Um, but the internet allows us to talk to people around the world or just across the town or talk to experts. Uh, they provide opportunities for engaging with new literacies. And of course, we need um, our students to learn to engage with these literacies. We need them to know what to do with these new technologies. Importantly, at the moment, we need them to be able to distinguish between a real news source and a fake news source, between real news and fake news. And they enable learners to publish and have their work viewed by an international audience. And of course, beforehand, we could publish, but it was much more of a, a long drawn out process. Now we can have um, students in a, in a classroom producing things online and putting them up that day. So these are all the things that you can do, but you need to adapt your pedagogy to be able to make use of them. So I'll just nip through three of the things which we've, uh, the pedagogies that we've covered. They're probably pedagogies that you've dealt with to some extent, um, just to show you the sort of thing we're thinking about. So one of the things is the flipped classroom. So with the flipped classroom, uh, the learners are sent to access the content at home. Now that gives them the option to look at it at their own pace, to make notes if they want to, to go backwards, to go forwards. So that when they come into the classroom, you can re make really good use of having the teacher there to support you and guide you. So in the class, you might be um, engaging in activities around critical thinking. You might be doing critical exploration. You might be talking to the teacher about things that you didn't understand. So it's, um, in some cases, a much more effective way of um, teaching and of using teaching time, um, sort of flipping what you do at home and what you do in school. But of course, it comes with its own limitations. You need to be sure that all your students can access things at home and are able to do that. And you need to be sure that your students are doing their homework, because if they're not doing their homework, um, things fall down. So we're not saying that new pedagogies are always good, but we, we're saying there are good things about them and we need to think about how they're implemented. Um, a second one. I suspect everybody in this, in this uh, conference is, is aware of MOOCs, the Massive Open Online Courses. This was Massive Open Social Learning, thinking about what the advantages are of scale in, in a massive course. 
um, because we hear a lot about, oh, well, I've got 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 500,000 people in my course. But what's the advantage to the learner? Do they benefit from being in there with another half million people? Or would they really rather be in with just 10 people and get attention from the teacher? So we were thinking here about the benefits uh, that you can get by being in such a large cohort. And a clear benefit is you can access new information, you can access new perspectives, uh, perspectives that your, your teacher, however expert your teacher, they're not going to know about perspectives in every country in the world, in every sector. So you can really pull what you know, but in order to do that, A, you need the option to be able to do that. Um, you need um, chat spaces to do that. B, you need to be encouraged to do that. And C, you need to see the value of doing that. Um, so it's not just a matter of having some content up and having a forum that people can go to. It's about having a pedagogy which really brings the two together and engages people. And the third one I'm going to think about here is a slightly different one about learning by doing science with remote labs. Um, quite a lot of the new pedagogies that we've covered have dealt with um, science, about citizen science, for example, about um, learning together with science. Uh, this one is thinking about how can you, can you get an authentic experience of being a scientist and using real equipment. So that picture there is the telescope which we have on our campus at the Open University. Uh, but we're, of course, a distance learning institution, so none of our students actually come to that telescope. Uh, they operate it online and they book time on it. Uh, we also have access to um, a bigger telescope in Mallorca. Again, our students aren't actually in Mallorca, but they join together in groups of six or seven. Um, they come up with questions, they book time on the telescope, and they use it in the same sort of way that um, an actual astronomer would use it, because the astronomers aren't necessarily by the equipment, they're using it remotely. So it's giving a much more authentic experience. Um, the telescope's one example, but of course there are lots of forms of equipment that you can use at a distance and get the same sort of experience that a, a real scientist would do. So again, it's thinking about the technologies that are out there and how we can use them to support our learning. So I'm just ending up with a slide there. Those are the um, pedagogies which were used um, in the 2016 report, uh, which we did with Singapore. Uh, this year's new reports um, will be up on the website on the 7th of December. So I encourage people to go and take a look and see what innovations we've spotted this year. And that's the end of my talk. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was a great interest indeed. And uh, I noted uh, um, several important aspects to be addressed in, in the discussion afterwards. So now we, uh, as promised, uh, proceed with uh, further reflections. And uh, now uh, it's time for our colleagues from the USA. So Sharon Goldstein is the first in my list. So Sharon, I will be opening the slides in a moment and hope you, you are ready to, to provide your insights here. OK. Um, are you able to hear me? So yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm my role at Berkeley College is the campus operating officer. Um, we have about 6,500 students at Berkeley in New York and New Jersey, and we have approximately 1,200 students who are studying completely online. And my role as campus operating officer um, is to deal uh, on the administrative operational. Um, almost non-academic side. So I think that I am coming um, at this topic a little bit differently, um, but you'll see that it all, um, I believe, meshes together. Um, Berkeley College um, is, is proudly recognized by USDLA um, as being certified for uh, our quality standards certification. And we've also been recognized uh, for the fourth year in a row by the US News and World Report for best online bachelor's degree. So um, I want to talk um, about engagement 
and how important targeted engagement and personalization is in retaining students. And so we have come to understand, of course, that um, by being engaged and connected in a virtual environment, that will lead um, to uh, more of a feeling of engagement and ultimately retention. And so um, the more the students are academically and socially involved, the more they're likely to persist and graduate. And clearly, you know, that is, is, is our target. We want to see our students to be successful. And so our goal here is to connect with our population of distance learners with a targeted and personalized outreach and create opportunities for students to engage within our virtual community. So innovation and technology always remains at the forefront because this is how we can improve the experience of our students. Um, we recently put together um, a, an, an online opportunity starting with our students right at the beginning when they apply to Berkeley College. And we actually have a very interactive um, admissions process. They work closely with admissions representatives virtually, of course, with, uh, via webcam as well. But we are currently using a Blackboard platform, and we have the students right involved in Blackboard, working in Blackboard as they complete their enrollment process. Um, we also have um, a new student orientation, and it has the theme of students traveling to different, different destinations. And each destination is a support service that is offered at Berkeley. And we've animated this a bit, and we've made it very engaging. And what we did this year, well, let me back up a bit and say that the support services are very important to our students in succeeding. The classroom um, experience is indeed what they are here to do. But if we don't have appropriate support services in a way that we can deliver to those students in a flexible and convenient way, um, the picture is really not complete. And so our orientation is designed for the student to engage um, and to see what, in fact, is available. And so this year, we added a, um, a, uh, an interactive component to it. And we start out by asking them to put their name in. Um, and then you can see that the screen will then speak to them directly. And so the first thing that our students would do is to select the type of student that they are, whether they're a new student, a returning student, or they are becoming an online student after taking courses elsewhere. And so once they select that, they continue on a very specified orientation route. Again, we are looking for information from our students. So we have included questions that we ask our students that we will be able to retrieve on the back end and learn a lot about them. So as they're going through this orientation, they're not only learning about what we have to offer to them, but it's an opportunity for us to engage with that student, of course, asynchronously, and learn about their, their motivators and the things that are important to them. So we start out by asking them um, why it's important that they commit to graduate. Um, this is something we've done at our on-site campuses. And so they will type the answer in there. And another question that we might ask is adding college classes to your already busy life can be challenging. How can we help you be successful? Sharon, or what, whatever our student's name is. And we're getting a lot of really good information back from our students. And um, while online learning is certainly convenient and flexible, um, it does require a lot of focus. Um, and, and it requires people to be very well managed with their time. And we find that our students struggle um, with being able to balance all of the things going on in their lives. So we feel that if we can learn this early on, you know, it can, it can help us support our students. And so this is what it looks like, just an example on the back end. You can see across the top, those are the questions that we ask throughout the entire orientation. And it's an example of two students and their questions and, and their answers. And that information is given to the support, various support services, so that when we do our outreach to the students, we have talking points. We have areas where we can pick up on a conversation. We can say, I see that this is important.
important to you. I see that you may be struggling with this. I see that you might like more information on that. And so it allows us to have a more meaningful conversation. So the commit statements, um, they filled in, I commit to graduate. We actually turn these into banners, and those banners get posted on their individualized homepage of, of Blackboard. So every time that student logs in to access their courses, they are reminded why they commit to graduate. Um, again, this is, this is just um, a screenshot of a theme um, in the orientation. Um, we do have the um, airplane theme that we're flying to different destinations, so we've incorporated that. Just some, just some silliness I'm showing you. And here is a picture, actually, of the portal. When the students log in, this is updated by each of our support areas minimally once a week, so that every time the students log in, they get a sense of what's important for them, what is going on in the different support areas, and of course you can see in the upper left hand corner their commit statement is right there and on the upper right hand corner it lists their academic advisor and their career services advisor as well so they will always have this within reach one of the um, um, newest um, features that we have incorporated um, with the use of technology is data analytics um, which has been very helpful um, and informative. We are working with the Civitas platform, and um, this technology looks at about a thousand different touch points of our students, and it goes into our records, it goes into Blackboard, it goes into PeopleSoft, which is um, our support uh, platform as well. And it gives us a predictive look at each student, and it talks about whether they are a high persister, very high persister, um, low, very low, moderate. And so it allows us, when we're doing our outreach, to really focus on targeted groups. Uh, in addition, we can see um, that it breaks it down by the uh, powerful predictors. Um, for example, one of the powerful predictors is engagement with the LMS. And so we can actually chart that out, and we can see with this data who is not participating or who is participating on average less than others within the same class. And it gives us really great information, and it allows us for um, further enhanced outreach. So with that information, we put together um, four different initiatives based on this information. And again, one of them was distance from average in the discussion board. Um, and we have very targeted outreach uh, with not only our academic advisors, but our folks from the Center for Academic Success. We have another initiative that we use this data with um, for our readmitted students to the online campus. And we find that those students do not always succeed. And what I want to point out here is that we are working here not only with academic advisement, but with our student development and campus life uh, group, as well as campus operations. Our third initiative is looking at first term student persistence. Our students, we find that if we have them um, complete the first term and the second term, they're more likely to persist and graduate. And so this data, um, using this technology is really helpful to see who are our high persisters, predict, you know, our predicted high persisters, and who may need additional support. Um, and then we went ahead and we put together um, a very um, inclusive um, outreach um, initiative. And then finally, the last initiative was to provide time management support. And again, you can see um, we target, we look specifically for our moderate uh, uh, folks, the moderate and the low. We feel that the very high will persist regardless of what we do. Our very low persisters will likely not persist um, regardless of what we do, short of doing the work for them, which of course we're not going to do. Um, and so it, it allows us to really hone in on the students um, that need specific help um, as we go along. And so this is just a snapshot um, of the four initiatives across the top 
um, are the weeks of our semester. And across um, the vertical line, we see the different departments. And so you can see there's, there's quite a bit of collaboration and outreach among and between the various departments. Um, and again, this is all driven by the use of this um, you know, innovative brand. So um, in addition to our cross-developmental practices, you know, it's just technology aside, we, we really um, um, come back to the basics. And we believe that our students write their own stories, and they have their stories to tell. And as much as innovation uh, and technology is a wonderful thing, um, sometimes there is just absolutely no substitution for good old-fashioned um, caring, outreach, um, empathy, and we find that that's truly helpful as well. And um, so we're looking for ways to, to do that as well. And so at the end of the day, we're looking for retention. We're looking for persistence. And through um, these different initiatives, um, we have broken it up in either semester to semester retention, year to year retention. We look at cohort retention. And this, while this is relatively new, we are very optimistic because we are seeing positive signs and indications that this targeted engagement um, is, in fact, leading to um, better persistence. Um, in addition, we um, are also building in um, virtual reality into what we are doing at Berkeley. We have a task force that we started about a year and a half ago to see how we can incorporate that into the classroom. And we have started with our health studies school, and we have brought VR into that. In addition, we have uh, piloted, very excited about this, a virtual reality um, orientation experiences on the campus. And we have our students using VR as they go around the campus, looking at various things and being introduced to the various support areas. So we are actually um, going to be entering, 2018 is entering Berkeley's 20th year of offering online um, education. And so we have a year packed of innovation in 2018, and we are going to be doing a system-wide VR exercise um, or program that we are going to hopefully be involving thousands of our students with Berkeley-branded cardboard devices and having a very exciting event. We are also um, working with adaptive learning, as we know that this is something that is, is truly um, helpful to the students and, and, and allowing them to work at their pace, um, at their learning style. Um, gamification is something, too, that I wanted to include, that our instructional designers are working with our faculty to include in not only our classroom experience, but some of the um, um, extracurricular activities that we work on delivering to our students that we include gamification. Our orientation is going to, in the future, we're working on updates that will include a gamification experience as well. Um, and um, we have not yet gotten involved in geotargeting in real time on the campuses, but it is something that we are exploring. And so um, that wraps it up for me. Um, innovation is what drives us at Berkeley. Um, and you know our students getting to the finish line, walking across the graduation stage, um, finding ways to engage them and to have them feel like they are not lost in cyberspace, but very much connected, not only in the classroom, but in a greater community. That, that is our focus, and that will continue to be our focus. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sharon. An interesting presentation from, from your side. Uh, let's move on as we are getting a little bit uh, maybe shorter of time. Let's move to further uh, presenters. Uh, without posing uh, many questions now. So, Marcy, are you uh, ready to I continue? Am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, one thing, I knew that I was going to be taking, coming about fifth or sixth in the process of speakers, so I wanted to take a broader, a different approach to challenges and opportunities and innovative online learning. Um, 
So when you look at the challenges, um, one of the things that, some of the things have already been mentioned. Let's look at a few others. Uh, one of the things we see quite a bit, of course, is regulatory, and no matter where you're located throughout the world, there are requirements or restrictions that we have to work through with policymakers to help them understand the power of our and to open up the doors for innovation. There are ways to address this. Um, funding is always an issue. And that's one of the reasons that we have associations like EFA, SDLA, and others so that we can find collaborative partners and find innovative approaches together for the innovation. Privacy issues is quite a big topic right now. Uh, earlier this year, our partner, Eden and USDLA's partner, ICDE, hosted a learning analytics event in Nancy, Nancy, France, uh, and we looked at learning analytics the, for personalized data, the, some of the issues that we've run into with resistance. So that's always a challenge that we need to look at. But on the other hand, there are other challenges like for us who are trying to innovate, and those of us who are in the world of online business learning, we look at how fast the technology changes, how fast new technologies are coming at us, how quickly people are, just the algorithms and everything else that they can do from software to hardware are really changing the way things uh, are possible, what is possible online. And so when we have to imagine what is possible, it becomes difficult for some, it becomes scary for others. And so we have to look at that. The most important thing, though, is that we make sure we don't lack the attention to stakeholders. And by that, I mean, let's look at the students behind why we're in Let's look at who we're preparing the student to work for or the way we're reskilling our students in that lifelong learning perspective and where they're going to use that education. So to really hone in on not innovating for innovation's sake, not implementing technologies for technology's sake, but really how we're able to do this for the learner. And then it's already been mentioned, but we always need to focus on the importance of proper training. Two things that I've come across also with this is FUD, what we call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. With a lot of people that many of you will be working with, there will be faculty members, instructors, and instructional designers, and occasionally administrators who have a fear of us trying something new and different. What if? What if? What if it doesn't work? What if we can't? We can't do this. What? What if it replaces us as teachers? And those are big challenges. And the yeah buts. Have you ever worked with people that have said, virtual reality, yeah, but that won't work in education. Or yeah, but, you know, that's all fluff. We need to get back to good pedagogy. Or yeah, but there's always people that are going to be negative when we're trying to innovate. So we need to figure out how to address those. When we look at the opportunities, we realize that we need to, we can replace this fear, this uncertainty, this doubt, and even open up the minds of politicians and those that are going to control the reg uh, regulatory requirements or restrictions, if we can enlighten them on the power of these technologies and these capabilities in education. So we need to also proactively serve the impact of policy. We can deal with the privacy issues. We just work together in our partnerships to figure it out. And one of the new things that we also learned is that it's very important to, when we see these old and new technologies, how we apply them to teaching and learning. And then what is good pedagogy, andragogy, and pedagogy? How are we providing proper training for these? One of the things I've been working on for the, well, for the last couple of years with Drexel University which is in Philadelphia, it's in the top 100 universities, it's a private university in the state. Um, the president of the university online knew that she wanted her faculty to innovate. 
and she wanted them to be able to try and experiment and, and opportunity to really change the way they were delivering education. But she knew she needed to show them what's out there, what's possible. Now, what is augmented reality versus virtual reality, virtual holography? What is uh, adaptive learning? How is that cha tra changing the way that we can teach? What is artificial intelligence? And helping people understand how that can be applied and what's available. And so we worked on this research to go out to see innovatively what people were doing throughout the, uh, throughout the world. And we looked for innovations in uh, many of these topics. These are 10 that we're going to cover this afternoon. Uh, for me, it's this afternoon. For you, it's this evening. Um, I just put up a link for USDLA. And what we did was we went out and researched in these topics and several others who was innovating, how was it impacting education, uh, what, what's possible. And then we decided to put it in bite-sized chunks for our faculty so that they could easily say, ooh, how could we apply robotic telepresence to our nursing faculty, to our nursing students? How would that transform the way they're getting their online education or what's possible? And these little three-minute videos of how a wonderful university has implemented the technology and changed the way they do things whatever their innovative approach might be. And so we created this website and made it possible for everybody to go and see in bite-sized chunks what's possible, what people are doing. Now Coventry University in the UK is doing some amazing things with serious games. Now um, Salzburg University of Applied Science has worked with their government to create a new augmented reality version of their sustainability garden of sustainability and how that's led to them creating a company called Polycular and it has a new learning platform so that we can design, easily use it to design AR lessons. So these are the things that we went out and included. We're going to co cover some of those um, in, the, in this afternoon. But all of those are available if you want to peruse uh, and I'll put the link up in just a moment. Um, it's called Virtually Inspired. And the other reason that I bring this up is very important. Not only will you be able to see what can be done, but you'll also be able to uh, peruse and there's a place to share your story. Many of you on this call in this webinar or that will watch the recording are the innovators. Share that with the world. Share that with us so that we can highlight you. Those are just a few. I'm not going to uh, continue any longer because I want to hear what Tim has to say. Uh, but uh, I'll just stop the presentation there and wait for more questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. I still uh, hear the echoes, you know, every time I, I have the presentation on virtually inspired, people get really astonished, you know, and ask a lot of questions and want some practical examples. So this is a very great reference. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I will stop the presentation here because, yes, the team is here with us and um, he also has a very uh, interesting story to tell. Uh, I think I found your PPT version team, if I'm not mistaken, on Adobe Connect, and here it is. Thank you very much, Irina. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's always difficult coming, coming last after such a strong presentation, so I wanted to give a, a slightly different uh, approach to the, the question of innovation because my background's in computer science, but I've been in university governments for, for more than a decade now, so I've seen innovation come and innovation go. So I wanted to, if you like, try to defend the need for innovation and make some practical suggestions on how we might harness it and uh, and overcome some of the difficulties. I'll define these, uh, these terms in a, 
in a while. Um, what's clear at the moment, if we actually pay any attention to um, the, the, the press at the moment, is that uh, the question, the future of, uh, of uh, universities is really being, being questioned. Some analysts even go as far as to predict uh, a closure of up to 50% in the next, uh, next 10 years, which is actually really quite interesting when you consider that the, well, it's actually been, been said that the uh, educational market is worth something in the region of, of uh, $6 trillion. So there seems to be something which is, doesn't quite fit together there about these two different uh, aspects. Okay, so I think that uh, innovation is really going to be absolutely key in the, in the future of, um, of education, you know, all different types of uh, levels of education, not just higher education. And I think we can, we can borrow the term disruptive innovations specifically in this context because, um, well, at least um, I use disruptive uh, innovation to mean innovation that can really actually bring about a change in the, in the base um, business model of an institution because it's, uh, it's naive to believe that innovation is not going on in institutions. All teachers, all good educators and professionals are innovating every day, but unfortunately this doesn't really see its way through to the, uh, to the changes in the institutional practice, which I think is so, uh, so important. So let's move on to think of a, an, an agile ap approach to how we can actually apply innovation. Now, I'm borrowing the term agile from the agile methodology, which comes from software engineering, which really, um, it's, it's, to, to simplify, refers to um, its, uh, its iterative approach with a set of um, evolving uh, requirements and, and solutions. So we're constantly needing to, uh, to change what we, what we do and how we incorporate it into our overall educational uh, process. And um, I think this can be really characterized, characterized as something which we can provoke in our, in our staff. It's something we can promote. And also, once it actually happens, it's a question of how we can actually channel the results into uh, fine-tuning our, our business model and, and helping our institutions to provide a more effective uh, um, educational practices, which are actually what the students wanted in the, in the first place. Now, this if you like, two ways we can we can think about this. We can think about it in a, in a top-down fashion. Also, at the three levels um, highlighted in the introduction to this particular webinar, it can be either an individual, institution, or or outside of our institutional initiatives to try and get us to innovate and incorporate these these changes. But I think, being more realistic, a lot of this innovation is actually is bottom up. And I think the key uh, technique here is just to get out of people's way. I think, as I said before, a lot of uh, good uh, teachers know what they're actually doing, and it's a question of letting them get on with it and trying to uh, make the, the best of this and, and incorporate it into our overall um, institutional strategy. So the, the, the key thing here, if you like, in my opinion, is trying to uh, reach this delicate middle point of um, of achieving a high level of flexibility while at the same time achieving uh, or maintaining, should I say, quality across the educational uh, services. Because uh, sometimes when we, we want to innovate, we want to try new things out on our courses, then we're not always allowed to do it um, from a, a managerial perspective because there's this, this fear somehow that it's going to negatively impact uh, upon the, uh, the way that uh, the, the, our institution is brand and the way we're actually we're doing this uh, overall uh, process. And I think the, the expression of dog fooding is really quite, uh, quite relevant here, the idea of, uh, of eating our own dog food in the sense that what we do on a daily basis is what we can actually do to in incorporate change into the uh, overall um, process. And um, I think what's actually quite important here is the, the idea of uh, the speed, which actually agile and agility, to actually bring, out, bring, bring about change in this particular process. I think the, I put the picture of the oil tanker here because um, you know, I sometimes get the feeling in, in, a, in a big institution that trying to produce change can actually be a slow and difficult process. And um, if we can only get the boat to behave a little bit more like a jet fighter and be more agile, then um, it, I think it would be very, very uh, valuable. And um, 
obviously another factor of this which I think is really key is the idea of staying relevant. I mean, if you had a chance to see some of the news clips I put up um, at the beginning, uh, companies like, like Google, for example, uh, now don't appear to be concerned about whether the, the students have studied at a university and have an official qualification. They're looking for other kinds of, uh, of uh, ways of assessing the, the person's uh, ability to be able to integrate into the workforce and actually provide value for for their, for their company. So this, in a way, is something we need to do. We need to be able to try and see where the ball's going. If we had a crystal ball, it would be really, really handy, but unfortunately, we don't. So I think really sometimes what experience shows is uh, it's really quite a good idea just to, to try a load of stuff and um, keep what works and, and discard which uh, the stuff that doesn't really work. So maybe I can um, give a an example of the way we've actually done this at, um, at UNED, where I, where I work, and we've done it in, in two different ways. We're actually trying to figure out what our students actually want. How can we actually listen to them? Well, the first thing we we did, if it doesn't appear too obvious, was actually to ask them. We set up a, um, a collective awareness platform and actually got them to um, make suggestions about the sorts of educational services they would like from us and where do they see the, the bottlenecks in this process and what could we do to, to really uh, improve our, our game here. And from this, we got uh, nearly 900 different ideas, which are now being analyzed and we're trying to, uh, we're trying to figure out how we can incorporate, in, incorporate them into our, our educational processes. But on the other hand, as well as asking them, we can see what they actually do. I mean, we, we've seen briefly references to, to analytics um, made in, in previous presentations, and they really are going to, to be key. We've tried to use them in a very elementary fashion so far to actually see the way that um, um, the evaluations are actually being used by the students, because if we can anticipate what they want, then we can adapt the services so that they, they work in a, in a better fashion. It's actually very difficult. There's a, a lot being published on, on the, the advantages and disadvantages of, of analytics, and I think we're all painfully and slowly climbing up the learning curve here, and this will have a lot to, uh, to offer in the, in, the, in the future. So if I can just uh, finish with... Um, if the way the way that I kind of um, conceive of this whole uh, this whole conceptual space of, of innovation, and um, I really think that these days, and I think more so in the future, we're going to see a blurring between what is the the formal informal, perhaps non-formal learning context, which our institutions uh, have a key role to play, and what we might call digital living. I mean, if anybody, as part of their daily transport, picks up a, an underground or a bus, you see the majority of people using mobile devices. And I think a lot of them are not actually playing games on these devices. They have to do meaningful things with this. So this whole way that we interact with our learning and our living um, is actually changing, and we need to be able to reflect this in our educational process. And um, I think this is quite important because if, in a way, the sorts of jobs that our students were being prepared for maybe 10 years ago or even five years ago are now quite different from the sorts of things they, they're doing now and will be doing in the future. So in order for first thank you thanks a lot Tim. so uh, now we have really a bunch of very very important insight and uh, and I would like to to keep this time for discussion really active so first of all we have uh, interesting questions already posed uh, one of them was by Sumati so what training needs to be done and uh, actually, we heard some suggestions already during presentation, uh, like uh, uh, when speaking about opportunities, I heard uh, them very well listed by Rebecca, uh, who mentioned new ways of inquiry, uh, collaborative learning activities, engaging uh, learners in new literacy, other things. And then we talked about uh, uh, well, about the risk actually of uh, underestimation of misuse of uh, innovations. And I think this uh, trend was through all presentations that we need to share uh, the concept, uh, the practice, uh, the outcomes, the impact as much as possible. I try to link somehow these. Um, 
these ideas with the authentic experiences uh, that also were mentioned in your presentations and how to use these authentic experiences to establish support and help and to use this support and help from all over the world because we we are global with the help of experiences and we should find the best way to put these innovations in the area of open and distance learning to contextualize them in correct pedagogical uh, situations and to share this so that we all together establish training and support and help and then to focus maybe on, on some priorities in, in Europe and other regions. So one thing is how you, how you see this help, training and support uh, to be realistically implemented uh, from the perspectives that, that you have from the organizations, countries, regions, expert networks, uh, what do you think should be the priorities now, uh, as, as you think? Uh, we also may uh, absorb divide, actually. We talked about divide uh, uh, with, the, with the people in the open coordination groups and um, at European Commission and, and, and also in expert uh, professional networks. The divide is obvious. A misunderstanding of, let's say, uh, misuse of innovations that sometimes cause very, very expensive solutions in countries and organizations. We also notice divide in the programs. We see Horizon program, for example, in Europe, which is very scientific and already very high level um, productive consortia working on research. But the divide is ob obvious with the practitioners, with the level uh, where the majority of teachers and learners work. And, and how to bridge this divide, I think, again, we need to think about training, sharing, and authentic help and authentic experiences. Uh, I would like your short comments on, on what you hear now from me uh, in, these, in these questions, and maybe some deeper insight, because I, I am among uh, most outstanding professionals now. So, shall we apply the hand raise, or maybe uh, I already can see someone who would be willing to, to, to reply on this question. Uh, if not, Tim, maybe we could start with you. Because As I move forward in the, over the next uh, decade or so, then we need to be able to adapt what we're offering to what they really need. And, I, and that's why I really would defend the role of innovation. And, and think that we need to um, try and make it as easy as possible for our staff and our colleagues to uh, to participate in this in this process. Okay, so thanks very much. I won't go on any further. So we've we've got time for discussion. Um, Institutional training is very important, but it can also be um, expensive. And I think from experience that uh, people often don't see the value of the training unless they really need it in the, in the short term. I think um, if, we, if we accept that we don't apply, for example, new te techniques, new tools right across the board, um, we don't go from, from zero percent usage to 100 percent in a short period of time, that we don't necessarily need to train everyone at the same time. So therefore, we can characterize our Thank you. Uh, I think Timothy's right. I think it's a gradual change. Um, but I also think we need to begin to think about what happens at teacher training and at lecturer training. Um, I, I think it's unreasonable to carry on training people in exactly the same way and then assume they'll pick these skills up as they go along. Um, for example, I've been thinking about learning analytics now for several years and how you train um, people to, to make use of them. And there's a lot of skills involved. It's not just a question of being presented by with a specific tool and told, well, you know, you can look at this and you can see what's going on. It's, it's also about 
being able to question the relevance of that for what you're doing. It's also being able to question the underlying model and say, well, is this something which is useful to me? Can I accept these results as valid and reliable? Uh, just because they were valid and reliable for a cohort three years ago, are they still valid and reliable for my students? Um, so there's a whole extra layer of data literacy, um, which I think when we were trained, um, we, we won't have encountered at all, we'll, we'll come across in our careers, but I think we need to think, every, every year we need to be rethinking what is it that our new teachers, our new lecturers need to be learning about and how can we support them to do that? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we lost uh, Brikana. She wrote to me that uh, she she has issues with with computer uh, battery, but uh, apologized uh, for that. But we uh, have uh, Marcy and uh, Sharon and uh, also uh, Sumati. I, I hope you also hear the answers uh, from the experts uh, to your questions on what training needs to be done. I still remember your question post. And maybe you would like to comment here a little bit or to... Uh, uh, yes. Um, do, do you receive the answer well, to uh, what concerns you? Rebecca you're... did touch upon uh, what I uh, was initially uh, raising as the point on training for teachers we we need to we can't keep pushing on the fact that we want all these digital technologies and learning in the digital age without actually educating the people who are supposed to educate the, the students um, and yes it is differential different types of teachers need a different kind of push and some are more willing um, I wonder though um, if making more data, real-world data available and learning through using this real-world data or big data or open data would be um, an, an easy way to do interdisciplinary learning, teaching and learning on the part of students. Uh, would, it, would that be feasible? Would it help with training and would it help with learning at the same time? If governments uh, were to make I would take a chance maybe data available because you would ha you would need to do interdisciplinary thinking, critical thinking and an analyzing the data and so it would offer an opportunity for learning and for teaching at the same time. So I just wonder if the other experts have any views on that. Uh, from uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, from even perspective, uh, from what we hear from our communities of practices in even, I would take a risk uh, a little bit commenting here that actually what we notice is that in Europe we are already quite complex, I would say. Uh, we are complex in understanding, we are complex in having very different instruments and tools and in thinking. We don't think about segments even, but we think about the complexity and the big picture, which is very good. Uh, but at the same time, we also um, identify, divide between the uh, complex, good puzzle of thinking and smaller bits and pieces, you know, that our teachers uh, work with. So uh, before, you know, giving the the whole picture, I would say, of the big data available and the variety of experiences, because we already have a number of innovations, for example, put in the, in the pod here in this webinar room. You know, what we need is actually to very, very practical approach to things, very practical training, and uh, as Rebecca says, putting them into context and knowing why we use them and how to use them, you know. so in order not to increase the divide, not to teach very segmental and then very complex things, we need to put them together somehow, maybe in the levels or, you know, different complexity approach or what we have in, in, in Europe usually is the levels of FQF and other levels that we have in the system. So to bring community together from bottom up uh, in a very consistent way. But this is my... Uh, 
reply from what I observe in discussions in European and global events, but maybe someone would like to... Yeah, may I? Um, I think one of the things we need to think about, when we start to look at the idea of training, we think very complex and how difficult and how fast things are changing. But when you think, it, especially as an administrator that's very concerned about making sure everyone uh, knows how to do it or their, the value in doing it, of course, you have to address the value and why, what's in it for them as an educator, uh, how it can help them. And But I, I think the other thing when you think about how much of can make the training more simple. For years and years, for 20 years I've been learning, uh, people, it, it could be very complicated. Uh, and keep learning different technologies and learning LMS systems. And all of that just overwhelms our instructors. Uh, you take an approach like Oral Roberts University, which is in the U.S., but they have a, a campus and they wanted to look at online learning. They wanted to create a very innovative way for all of their faculty. Marcy, sorry, we, we stopped hearing you. You I get away a little bit, some, some, <laughs> some difficulties in hearing you. Oh, sorry, there is a there is a, an echo and and sometimes you are with us, but then you yeah, you are yeah. somewhere in in the background right now. Um. Okay, did that change anything for you, or not? Can you hear me? You can hear me. Yes, now I can't hear you. So. I'm going to have to watch you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say it real quick in the finish. But what Oral Roberts University did was they wanted to really be innovative in their online learning program and provide their Ghana students an experience they never forget. So they looked at virtual reality and augmented reality, and they realized it was very complex to train their faculty unless they figured out a way to automate it and make it very simple for their instructors and take away that fear. And what they did Literally, they have a global learning center that they created with 10 uh, rooms that, where you can go in and create lessons or teach live. An instructor walks in and puts in their phone number, 10-digit phone number. And when they do, the room knows what the instructor wants to do. Is it time to teach a class? If so, it will connect to the um, far site students and to, to Zoom and to a meeting room to do video. It will enable them to do their lessons in VR or AR. If they're not in there for class, live class time, then it will automatically bring up the tools that they need to create a lesson. And they have a repository of, of over 10,000 learning objects. So any instructor in any subject from anatomy and physiology to sports to um, all sorts of different subjects, history, et cetera, can pull those objects and create a lesson in such a fast time and so easy that the people who don't consider themselves technologists whatsoever feel completely empowered. And so I think while training and doing this as a community and sharing learning objects like this uh, repository of 10,000 learning objects, all of that is part of what we do as a community. And if we can find a way to provide that training, but make it where it's as simple and as intuitive as possible, I think we empower our students, our, our instructors, um, the best way. And I'll just stop at that. Thank you very much, Marcy. Um, thank you. Uh, you. You know, we already have, uh, I think, the need to prolong the webinar and the discussion because, uh, well, I really appre appreciate the richness, you know, of the insights that all of you bring in here. And uh, of course, uh, this is not uh, uh, this is not what is discovered today. But I only see that our time is running out. 
what we have actually now in the pod, uh, people highlighted the innovations, the recent innovations that they wanted to highlight, which uh, uh, combine, uh, sorry, not combine, but uh, among which we have non-formal open learning, adaptive technologies, blockchain, uh, changing role of teachers, instructor to facilitator, digital credentials, hilpagogy, self-paced learning, transformative pedagogy and adaptive technologies. Uh, well, what we uh, uh, could follow in the chat, uh, we were doing it in parallel, all of us together, we received uh, in many important and uh, useful links from our panel speakers uh, mm -hmm. on some of the innovations mentioned in the pod. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have references for all of them, but we take this into consideration and I'm sure that uh, we will continue on that uh, in, uh, in Eden NAP areas and also in our conferences uh, and I'm sure we are all active on that. Uh, we still will be able to use uh, Twitter and Facebook and uh, Eden social channels and also the rest of European Distance Learning Week and the US National Distance Learning Week to address these issues. But uh, we need also to summarize and, and finalize uh, this webinar for of today. So uh, I thank you all for uh, being positive on attendance and for, on the contributions and on exchange. My final question would be, do we agree uh, that actually open and distance learning innovations contextualized in positive pedagogical situations, in correct pedagogical situations, meaningful ones, can improve quality of education? I think we're all working hard on this and uh, we all need to share and to share globally and regionally our authentic experiences. But I think all this brings the evidence and answers to Mother's question that we need training on innovations, on their meaningful applications. So for the final round, I give the floor to each panel speaker just to say one sentence that we bring with us to our... Um, I totally agree with you that uh, innovation is uh, extremely important uh, in um, um, be it open educational resources or in the training of uh, teachers or in the use of technologies for teaching. And um, please do keep coming with your suggestions uh, to the Commission and we will try our best to see what we can do to support in terms of policy and in terms of operational um, uh, in terms of projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. You do support and of course we hope that the support will continue. Thanks a lot. I know we lost the administrative and the operational side. Frame, and while I am the, involved in some of the um, aspects of teaching and learning, I'm not as immersed as others on the panel. And so um, participating and hearing about this from that side um, really enriches my role um, at Berkeley. Um, and it's all part of, of retaining our students and engaging our students and helping them um, helping them to learn. Um, in addition, um, absolutely, the, the faculty training and, and having faculty and educators be on board and excited to be part of the new technologies and the new learning methods and so forth um, is critical. And so um, I thank you all um, for allowing me to be part of the panel. And I look forward to more learning uh, and more innovating with everyone. Thanks. Bye. Oh, to make sure, <laughs> I got to put it back in. I wasn't paying attention. Um.
Okay. Not if you can hear me. My one sentence, thank you. My one sentence is that we must innovate and transform or reimagine or change education to the, the opportunity is great for what we can do to reach so many more students and engage them like they've never been engaged before and truly prepare or reskill them for their future. We must innovate and we need to all work together to overcome all the challenges and to realize all of the opportunities that are set before us. Thank you again for uh, inviting USDLA and for our partnership and this opportunity. So if you've got the early adopters, you've got the people that if you push them a bit, they'll jump on board. And then you've got the laggers, the people that are, are always going to be at the back of the queue, whatever happens. So if we actually do that, then we can begin to, to build up a, a critical mass, if you like, a community of people who have got, had the early experience. They've helped to, to debug the tools and, and seen the value of them. You get them on board, and then they can also become evangelists for the next generation. This can be a gradual change. I think that it works well that way. Thank you, Irina. I'd also like to thank everyone for the, the, uh, the opportunity to participate today. It's been a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of fun. I think um, the go-home message is that it's obvious that society is, is, is changing. Thank you very much. And my takeaway is that we feel very safe among our friends, close friends like you, and very high level experts. So we will continue and we will put every effort in our network to take innovations in an agile way, I learned it from Timothy, and create authentic experiences during training sessions. Thank you very much.